Welcome to the webinar, Understanding, Evaluating, and Treating Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorders. WPS is uh, sponsoring today's uh, presentation, the webinar with Dr. Sam Goldstein. We have been a leading independent publisher for over 75 years, and we do publish educational and psychological assessments and related intervention resources in the areas of autism, language, school and clinical psychology and occupational therapy. Today, I want to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sam Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein is an assistant clinical instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Utah School of Medicine and clinical director of Neurology, Learning and Behavioral Center in Salt Lake, Utah, um, Salt Lake City, Utah. Sam is a board certified pediatric neuropsychologist, licensed as a psychologist, and certified as a developmental disabilities evaluator in the state of Utah. He has authored, co-edited, or co-authored more than 50 books, including 24 textbooks, as well as approximately 70 book chapters and peer-reviewed scientific research studies, and eight psychological tests and assessments. Sam, I don't know how you keep track of all of that, but I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to Sam Goldstein. Dr. Sam Goldstein, Take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know there's some folks on from a number of European countries that have contacted me. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to join me today uh, in what is a very new topic. Um, and I'm coming to you from my office here at our clinic in Salt Lake City. I started this clinic with uh, a pediatric neurologist 42 years ago. And we have been consistently busy since then, seeing between a four and 500 children and a few hundred adults every year for neuropsychological evaluations. Uh, we tend to see more complex uh, cases of children with medical and related genetic and neurodevelopmental problems. So uh, having seen hundreds of children every year, uh, I have an interesting perspective of where were we 42 years ago and where are we now in regards to the kinds of behaviors we're gonna talk about today? Because in 1980 uh, or in the early 80s, uh, a child presenting with the kinds of behaviors and irritability we will discuss uh, was typically referred to as having a severe form of ADHD. I called it ADHD IR, which is not a technical uh, diagnosis, but ADHD irritability. And these kids had long emotional outbursts and were irritable. There has been, as we will discuss today, a research condition, severe mood disorder. Uh, but the problem with that is it's never been an accepted diagnosis. So third party payers and other organizations, institutional organizations, uh, didn't know what it was because it was just a research topic uh, that never found its way into any diagnostic uh, system. Well, uh, move forward in time and ADHD or severe ADHD and, and children with comorbid oppositional or anxiety problems eventually morphed into a bipolar disorder in childhood. And the same patterns of behavior were now uh, maybe by the 90s, mid 90s into the early uh, 2000s were referred to as bipolar, but uh, due to concerns longitudinally as to whether those children actually developed bipolar disorder of adulthood, which wasn't the case. Uh, again, questions were raised about diagnostically how to best understand and define uh, these problems, which again, as you'll see today, fall in two broad areas, uh, these extensive disruptive emotional outbursts uh, and this pattern of irritability. Uh, and it's the latter that's been difficult uh, to fit into this uh, new diagnostic protocol. So we'll, we'll talk about this new diagnostic protocol as well. And so now today, those children that 42 years ago, uh, we would have said are this severe ADHD with comorbid problems uh, are now being referred to as DMDD. But as you'll see, the diagnostic criteria are very discreet and it's actually quite difficult to fit children into that criteria. And we'll talk about why perhaps the criteria may be uh, too specific, meaning uh, it may omit children who have problems and are in need of help, uh, meaning milder cases, uh, as opposed to some diagnoses that are more sensitive and will include false positives. So what I wanna cover today, and hopefully if there's any problem with these slides as we advance them, uh, let me know. Um, so this is a very brief presentation 
And so I see my primary charge as moving quickly through a lot of information. The slides have a lot more content on them than I usually include. Uh, my suggestion is that you, uh, when you have time, download the slide deck and take your time to go through it. Uh, and, and I'll respond to questions at the end. I'll respond to questions uh, when we're offline as well. But this is what I wanna do. Uh, help you understand how this diagnosis came to be. Uh, it's uh, a new species, as it were, less than 10 years old. Uh, understand what the DSM says about it or the ICD-10, because uh, as of last year, it's now in the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases. Uh, I want you to understand how we evaluate for it when in fact we don't have a specific test or a questionnaire or a proven diagnostic protocol. Psychiatric diagnoses are primarily made by taking a history. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about differential diagnosis, what DMDD is and is not. Uh, we'll talk about emerging uh, methods of treatment. Uh, there's a belief that DMDD has a strong biological basis. I can tell you that I'm not a biological determinist, but I do think that while biology uh, doesn't determine your life, it does affect uh, probability, it increases vulnerability. And conditions like DMDD, like bipolar disorder, like schizophrenia, uh, may be uh, very strongly influenced uh, by uh, how your neurotransmitter system is operating. But I think it's also influenced by how your brain is built. I think DMDD maybe falls at the nexus between uh, one's biochemistry and one's brain structure. We sometimes call that physiology. And we'll talk about why that is. And finally, you'll see there's a lot of resources. There are a lot of links uh, for you to go and find out on your own about things. Because again, this, this uh, presentation, to do it justice, probably should be a full day. Uh, and perhaps at some point in the future, I'll see you at a conference and maybe we'll do it as a full day. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, three uh, very quick case studies. Uh, and, and I'm going to move very quickly through these. Uh, and these are three cases we saw here at the clinic. Uh, a young girl who was an irritable toddler, uh, restless, active, fidgety, came into the world agitated, um, demonstrated tics, uh, a, a wide range of, of uh, early onset physical and motor tics, very rigid about routines and what she would eat and what she would wear, uh, very literal in conversation. Um, came to me, the kids who come to our clinic, uh, I sometimes refer to as Job uh, or, or akin to Job. They have multiple challenges. Uh, I tend to see kids who come uh, because they're refractory to other treatments. And she'd been diagnosed, if you're aware of the, the DSM framework of unspecified anxiety and ADHD and a moderate tick disorder. Uh, characteristic of many kids with DMDD, uh, she was taking multiple classes of psychiatric medicine, but was refractory, was still having a lot of problems. I gave her an early uh, pre-adolescent uh, personality inventory uh, and she reported a lot of problematic thoughts and feelings. She had this triad of emotional distress, upsetting thoughts, and worry. If you know those first three items on the, uh, on the Connors, the broad spectrum Connors questionnaire, I'm, I think they're on the Basque as well, but those three showed up uh, in her presentation. I looked at her neuropsychological abilities and she really had no major deficits. Um, you know, she measured average in working memory. Again, she came in and worked with me without a problem. You can see her, her, her tests there. I don't, I'm not gonna give you scores. She had trouble on a CPT measure, a continuous performance measure. Uh, she had some trouble with motor and perceptual abilities and her academics were okay. Uh, she had some trouble with sentence reading fluency. And here's a, a second child. We'll come to summarize the three. Um, I apologize for that uh, meme there. Uh, all of these pictures look like these kids have ticks, and I didn't realize that when I put them in there. This is a boy who was immature socially, uh, quick to be oppositional and defiant, uh, long emotional outbursts uh, that would, uh, at a younger age, lead to him actually passing out. We talk about some children who at young ages hold their breath when they become distressed. He'd been diagnosed with a combined type of ADHD and ODD. Uh, he would steal impulsively. He had what I refer to as a low emotional threshold and a high intensity uh, of reaction. 
um, you know, he could he could recover from these, but sometimes it took him up to an hour to do so. Um, he didn't really understand the disruptive nature. He thought his problems were caused by everyone else. Uh, he didn't use thought to guide behavior. He was rigid, defiant. Uh, he was taking multiple classes of psychiatric medication, but still struggling. Uh, at school, he functioned a little bit better, uh, but again, uh, still having trouble uh, on uh, broad spectrum instruments, a, a broad range of, of symptoms, uh, and on narrow spectrum instruments, uh, problems that looked like uh, autism spectrum. Uh, he had problems with behaviors related to executive function. Uh, but uh, at school, he could hold himself to, together a little bit better. He had borderline neuropsychological functioning, problems with working memory, uh, problems with verbal comprehension. He had some real compromises uh, on a CPT. Again, he's taking medicine. He pays attention, but he's impulsive. He's behind academically. And one more youth, a little older, Adam. Uh, he's had, you see, multiple diagnoses there. Uh, and struggling with other challenges, kind of defiant and depressed, uh, addicted to electronics. Uh, there's a movement now to try and, and create uh, an addiction to electronics uh, diagnosis or an addiction to certain activities diagnosis. I've written about it in my web articles, if you're on my website, uh, about the challenges in creating such a diagnosis. Um, uh, again, restless, fidgety, easily distracted, uh, trouble with sustaining attention, uh, these frustrating outbursts, this pattern of irritability and, and negative mood and more days and more times through the day. There he is taking three classes of medication. Uh, the psychiatrist was considering atomoxetine or stratera as well. He had some picking behavior, rivalrous with siblings, uh, and nothing really seemed to work very well. Um, and again, I, I apologize for going quickly through this, but I just want you to get a, a feel for a comprehensive assessment. All that data is collected. Uh, he'd been taking his medicines uh, and still he was showing um, all kinds of uh, challenges. So what do these kids have in common? A, a history of early extreme emotional dysregulation and irritability. We'll look at the DMDD criteria here uh, in a minute. Um, almost all of them have past diagnoses of ADHD and adverse mood and disruptive behaviors. Uh, all of them seem to be refractory to multiple classes of medication, often in combination. Um, they, it just doesn't seem to help, which raises questions about their physiology, physical brain versus uh, neurochemistry. They all seem to have some social pragmatic and related problems. They all seem to have family members with mood disorders. They all seem to have a broad variation in their level of ability and achievement and neuropsychological functioning, suggesting that those variables might present with uh, uh, additional risk if they struggle with them uh, or a uh, lack of risk. Uh, but when I took all three through the DSM-5 criteria, you'll just have to trust me, they met these diagnoses. Uh, they met this diagnosis of DMDD. So let's talk a little bit about what we're talking about. It's a new diagnosis. So it's just since 2013. It was created in an effort to stem the tide of increasing diagnoses of bipolar disorder in childhood, when in fact, the emerging longitudinal data demonstrated these children really didn't develop bipolar and, and did present differently. I can tell you that irritability in childhood, excessive irritability in childhood, has been a research interest for a long time, but one that has yet to fit comfortably into a diagnostic protocol. DMDD is the first uh, real attempt to do that. And, and if you ask what are children like in their 40s with DMDD, we're probably going to have to wait another 15 or 20 years. We really don't know the outcome over uh, time. Um, it was created because of a concern about misdiagnosis or overtreatment for bipolar disorder. Um, it, it, it is a diagnosis that was really created to, to try and uh, identify and research and eventually help children with uh, extreme outbursts and irritability. 
Uh, it is controversial. Why? One, very limited research studies. Uh, they, they are less than 100. Um, many of them have bootstrapped uh, SMD or severe mood disorder populations to look at DMDD. Uh, there's no uh, epidemiologic category. The ICD, if you're familiar with ICD and uh, DSM, and I, I'm seeing some people raising their hand uh, and I'm not really sure what that means, but I'm going to uh, move on here because I, I can't stop to take questions in the midst of the presentation. If you're having trouble seeing the slides or hearing me, please uh, uh, put something into the text box and then we'll try and address it. Um, uh, the ICD uh, contains a, a, a diagnostic category uh, called persistent mood or affective disorder. It, it's new, look, October uh, 2021. And they added the DMDD. So they just put the, the DMDD criteria from the DSM into the ICD, uh, but it may be different in other parts of the world. And look at what this category, persistent affective disorder, cyclothymia, uh, dysthymia, which is more of a chronic depression, other persistent mood disorder, DMDD, other uh, speci specified persistent mood disorder, uh, and an unspecified category. Again, the unspecified categories are some symptoms, uh, some impairment don't meet any other criteria. So the ICD has other conditions that I suspect most of you, uh, well, in, in, as school psychologists, you're focusing on determining eligibility. So these aren't gonna be an issue, but even as clinicians, most of us really don't spend much time uh, considering these diagnoses uh, when kids uh, come in. Um, since the mid 90s, there's been concern that mania is different in kids than adults. Because as I mentioned, the initial longitudinal studies of bipolar in childhood did not demonstrate that the majority of those children developed bipolar in adulthood. And pediatric onset mania, so again, we're talking about the manic side of it, um, presented with severe irritability, unlike adults who seem to think they can solve the world's problems. This kind of mania was accompanied with irritability and was fairly brief uh, and discreet in its cycling. But look at that statistic. In less than a decade, uh, the diagnosis of pediatric bipolar increased 40 fold, 40 fold, not four times, but 40 times. And, and that was part of what the impetus was uh, to try and create a better diagnostic category. Um, and, and that conceptualization has also been associated with a sizable increase in mood stabilizers and atypical antipsychotic drugs in children. Those of you in clinical settings know uh, we see children coming in today. When I started 40 years ago, kids came in primarily on one form of stimulant or another. Uh, uh, slowly, some kids came in on SSRIs um, but it was very uncommon to see kids coming in as they are today on multiple classes of drugs, uh, anticonvulsants that are used for mood stabilization uh, or various antidepressants. Uh, and there was a concern, uh, some children died uh, from overdose. Uh, there was a concern about long-term safety data of these medicines. There was a concern about the stability of the diagnosis. Uh, and so, uh, there was, there's been an effort to try and standardize this. Now, let's take a slight tangent here, severe mood dysregulation. I suspect that those of you that are not involved in ongoing research, this is a new term. And NIMH coined this term, I'll, I'll show you how the diagnostic criteria are different. Uh, SMD uh, sort of was the birthplace for DMDD, uh, but SMD was really created to look at irritability and its relationship uh, to bipolar disorder. Uh, and again, there was a lot of research primarily focused on family history and bipolar and the phenotype of bipolar. And youth with SMD, as you see, look at that, three out of four kids with SMD met ADHD criteria and over 50% met ODD. So what does that mean? I mean, if 
if three quarters of kids with ADHD, with SMD, not with ADHD, but starting with SMD, have ADHD, then is it truly a comorbid disorder or are symptoms of ADHD part of SMD as well? As you're aware, uh, over the last 50 years, we started with, as Achenbach pointed out, two disorders of childhood, disruptive and non-disruptive, and or, or externalizing and internalizing. And we've cut the symptoms into smaller and smaller parts, uh, such that we now have much more overlap of symptoms between conditions. And we have the same thing with ADHD, where two thirds of kids, or excuse me, with autism, where two thirds of kids with uh, autism uh, demonstrate symptomatic threshold for uh, ADHD. So it's interesting that SMD had high rates of ADHD, high rates of ODD. You'll see what, what they tried to do with DMDD. And again, it's, it's mostly theoretical. It's not based on large field studies. And again, SMD never made it as a diagnostic uh, category for whatever reasons. So DMD is different from SMD. SMD requires these recurrent uh, outbursts. Um, but it include depressed mood, three hyperarousal symptoms uh, that were not included for DMDD. Um, you know, this led to a concern about mania, which was what SMD was looking at. And the age onset was different. SMD, they said before 12, uh, and the maximum period of symptom free was two months. Um, and with disruptive mood, you see there's two core criteria severe recurrent outbursts that tend to last for hours, kids are inconsolable, and this chronic non-episodic irritability. And I know when talking to some of you, uh, that's a difficult one to fit because you're supposed to be irritable, as you'll see, more times uh, than not. Um, DMDD is the only diagnosis in the depressive category that requires a childhood onset. Uh, and if you meet DMDD and ODD, you're only given the diagnosis of DMDD. I can see no reason for that, given that with SMD, 50% uh, of those kids uh, uh, did not meet ODD uh, criteria. Here's the criteria just quickly. And again, it, it's based on limited field studies. I think the, the researchers who made this contribution to the DSM uh, work diligently in a very short amount of time, but I think there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if the next version, the updated version of the DSM tries to make changes in DMDD. And as I sit here, I do not know that. Uh, there's the first criteria, recurrent temper outbursts out of proportion or duration. So uh, two-year-olds will have uh, recurrent temper outbursts. The question is perhaps how long do they last? Uh, how frequent are they? How intense are they? Uh, and the onset for the DMD diagnosis has to be after age six, because again, I would think they were concerned about false positives. Inconsistent with development, which means that if a child is developmentally delayed, we might expect that they would have more frequent or more intense uh, or uh, more uh, uh, longer uh, duration outbursts three or more times a week, uh, the moods between, this is one that's hard to fit in, persistently irritable or angry most of the day, nearly every day. This one is very difficult to fit in. What is persistently irritable? And if a child is spending uh, a couple of hours playing uh, on their iPad, uh, do we know if they're irritable um, if they yell and scream because they make a mistake, is that a sign of irritability? These are still not well-defined criteria, which at the moment I'm starting a, a project to see if we can define this better. It has to be 12 or more months. You can't be symptom-free for more than three months. Uh, remember SMD was two months. Uh, why this number was uh, picked, uh, just like why six out of nine symptoms are picked for for ADHD versus five or four uh, remains unclear. Uh, and then the remaining uh, uh, criteria, at least two of three settings. And uh, in the last two years with COVID, uh, it's hard to get that second setting, but you only have to be severe in one. And sometimes uh, in my experience is the kids we're seeing here in our clinic uh, often do much better at school uh, than at home. Before 10, 
by history or observation, but you can make the diagnosis uh, after six, but not before, or, and not after 18. Again, somewhat arbitrary. A full symptom has never been met for longer than a day. So you'll need to go and look and read about a manic hypomanic episodes to understand what that is. Um, and the behaviors are not caused by any of these other conditions. So what they're saying is, if you have bipolar disorder, you don't make a diagnosis of DMDD. If you have intermittent explosive disorder, you don't. If you have autism, and again, I, I, as I sit here, from my understanding of the research literature, for the moment, these are somewhat arbitrary determinations in an effort to perhaps not overdiagnose uh, or in an effort to try and look in a, in a, a spectrum manner, uh, what are the, what's the primary underlying problem and what other coexisting conditions occur with that problem. Uh, and it shouldn't be the effects of a, a substance problem um, or say a tumor or something that sets the child back. Now, this is my take on it. So look at all of these diagnoses and the description that's next to each one is my log line. So if anybody disagrees with this, I'm happy to discuss it, but DMD is not ADHD, which is a problem of immaturity and developing self-discipline. DMD is not bipolar disorder. And you'll see in a minute, uh, the research studies clearly show that uh, the bipolar is much more extremes up and down lasting longer periods of time. Uh, it's not a result of anxiety, which is I see as a challenge in confidence in predicting outcome. You worry about what will happen. It's not a consequence of unipolar depression, which is a result of just feeling helpless or hopeless. It's not a consequence of autism spectrum, which I see as a social pragmatic problem uh, with accompanying difficulty with self-regulation and atypical interests uh, and behaviors. So it's not that. It's not a personality disorder. Uh, the, the joke is that a mental health disorder bothers the people that have it and a personality disorder bothers everybody else, but not the person that has it, that, that it's, they see it as part of who they are. They don't see there's a problem with it. So I describe it as a, a behavioral style, a way of interpreting and interacting with the world. It's not fetal alcohol, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. If you're familiar, we now call it a spectrum. Uh, there's a link there uh, that'll take you to an interesting uh, um, uh, a handout, a pretty good summary handout if you're in the schools or in a clinical setting. It's a good document to have uh, a well-created handbook uh, that was just fairly recently made. But uh, a DMDD is not fetal alcohol. And the question you might ask is, well, if you have true fetal alcohol, you have a cleft lip and microcephaly, might you be more vulnerable to having DMDD? Uh, no one has the answer to that question. Uh, DMD is also not oppositional defiance, which is a problem of uh, resistance and strong will nature. It's not PTSD, a problem resulting from trauma. Uh, could uh, PTSD <clears throat> trigger DMDD? Unclear. Um, is it possible that if you have the biological vulnerability for DMDD, then you're more vulnerable to develop PTSD? Again, these are still unanswered questions. DMDD is not intermittent explosive disorder, if you're familiar with that condition. Um, yes, those kids with DMDD may explode emotionally, uh, but it's uh, not. So one might end up uh, uh, after a period of time and research realizing that all children with DMDD demonstrate intermittent explosive behavior, but not all children with intermittent explosive behavior have a full syndrome of DMDD. Now, reactive attachment disorder is an interesting one. It's a much debated topic. There's a lot of theory. There's a lot of belief. Um, some kids are inhibited in their failure to attach. Some are disinhibited. Um, is it, it, but it, it, does, it, does it, again, increase your risk of developing DMDD? Do the biological risks of DMDD increase the risk of reactive attachment disorder? Uh, unanswered questions. And DMDD is clearly not a normal variation of behavior. Um, and, and at younger ages, maybe it's an excess of normal behavior. Young children will have uh, emotional outbursts, maybe irritable. 
But at older ages, it's clearly a very atypical uh, pattern of behavior. Uh, here's the epidemiology. A very few studies have looked at it. Um, most of the studies that have done this have looked at populations of kids being followed for severe mood disorder and then tried to apply the DMD criteria to those cases. What's interesting is that like, say, symptoms of ADHD, uh, these symptoms are very common in kids referred, but the presentation of the disorder is much less common. Um, but the problem is, is that even kids with milder DMDD, and for the moment we don't have a DMDD unspecified or a mild DMDD as a, as a diagnosis itself, um, even mild symptoms are, are really quite impairing. And not surprisingly, we'll take a look at this, the rates of DMD symptoms in externalizing disorders and mood, uh, uh, mood related conditions um, is very high, but the temporal stability is not good, meaning the symptoms come and go. They don't last for a long uh, and steady period of time. And, and I cite these studies, you can link to these studies, but you can see in this particular study, uh, this was a, a going backwards rate from SMD, 3% uh, SMD, 4% DMDD. Um, look at this, uh, three epidemiological studies, and I take some liberties here in combining these data, but look, about half the kids um, and about 80% of the preschoolers had severe temper outbursts. And this is, this is epidemiologic data, so that's interesting. Um, and among school age kids, the prevalence drops when you use the DSM-5 frequency criteria, drops further when you use the duration criteria. Um, and when you use the full DMDD criteria, the prevalence is less than 1%. You, you understand incidence is how many people have it right now. Prevalence is how many people have it over a period of time, because sometimes uh, a diagnosis remit, sometimes new cases are identified. Uh, here's a, a, a prevalence rate uh, using the DSMD criteria and another pro, uh, preschool cohort, about 3%. Um, and again, you can see that kids who have uh, um, a DMDD uh, will have school-based problems. Uh, and even kids who don't have, uh, who are not, um, uh, fully meeting DMDD criteria will have equal problems. Here's one population-based study. So this is a DMDD study, about 400 kids. Um, DMDD was less than 1% using the strict criteria, um, relaxing the mania, hypomania exclusion criteria, meaning you, you don't have it for a, a day or more, uh, and then the frequency criteria. And then if you drop both criteria, uh, then in that sample, 5% of kids met DMDD. And you see the comorbidity, uh, high rates of uh, comorbidity, um, and high rates of presentation in kids with clinical uh, samples. So there's a clinical sample of uh, 900 kids referred for problems with behavioral outbursts. Half of them met SMD criteria. There's another study of kids with uh, both neurotypical development, autism, and ADHD. This is mothers reporting symptoms. And you can see the rates of symptoms that are reported, but how much it drops for neurotypical kids and how much it drops for the inattentive. I mean, the inattentive type of ADHD, perhaps, as has been hypothesized um, uh, as a concept or, or uh, a theory of sluggish cognitive tempo, may in fact be a very different condition with different risks and different outcomes. So again, as we look at these data, the strict criteria lead to maybe one out of 100 kids, but as we loosen the criteria, uh, more and more kids uh, seem uh, to meet the criteria. And there's a link to kind of take a look at all of this epidemiology. And then I thought it would be interesting, this is a recent study looking at DMDD and kids in the juvenile justice system, 10,000 kids, here's 3%. Uh, meeting DMDD. Um, and, and, you know, you can see there that uh, disruptive mood uh, occurs um, 
are more similar to kids with mood disorders than kids with say ADHD or conduct disorder. And it is classified as a depressive disorder. And that's the study, um, this is a 2018 study. That's juvenile justice. This is COVID, uh, which people of course are asking about. Um, uh, the, the, the slide that I originally had put up focused on autism and COVID. Uh, and I've slightly modified the slide. The deck you may have, I just did it before we started. The, the deck you are gonna look at will say um, youth with ASD, because I was specifically referring to that study. Um, but youth with, um, uh, you know, youth with any kind of mental health disorder are gonna have more trouble in COVID not unexpectedly. If you go on my website, I, I have a webinar that I've done uh, looking at the outcome data. Pediatric visits for, for medical care uh, among adolescents was cut in half in 2020, but doubled for mental health visits. So we're concerned about uh, this impact. And, and at least in my clinic, um, I'm seeing more kids referred uh, with the same kinds of problems and we're seeing kids with greater severity, but that's been a trend over the 40 years. Kids are referred to my clinic seem to have uh, more problems of greater severity, greater intensity and greater uh, duration over time. Um, and so I, I think what's happening is parents are spending more time observing their children and in doing so, uh, they, um, uh, they're more likely to see the kinds of problems their children are presenting and they're more likely to be concerned. So I won't be surprised if we see an increase uh, in the incidence of DMD di diagnoses, primarily because parents will bring their kids in. And also, as with autism, uh, as clinicians learn more and more about it, uh, I think there's a trend uh, to overdiagnose, uh, and then eventually the pendulum swings uh, back in the other direction. Um, and this is another, I, Apologize, that came up a little squampus. Um, you know, no studies yet on DMD and COVID. There's a link you can take a look at, 2021 link. Actually, there's two links there. Quickly, neurobiology, for those of you that are interested. Um, so uh, here's my theory. Some conditions are clearly neurotransmitter based. Uh, and those conditions like depression, anxiety, ADHD, uh, schizophrenia, even bipolar disorder, respond very well to uh, medications that impact neurotransmitters. I think other conditions like autism, learning disability, even personality uh, disorders um, have as much to do with the structure and the construction of the brain as biochemistry, which is why we don't have medicines that effectively treat these conditions. My working theory is that DMDD lies at the nexus. It really is a, a condition reflecting physiology, which is the nexus of how the brain is built and its structure, the hardware, and then the biochemistry of the brain, which is why we, we don't see great response uh, to medications. Uh, and in particular, uh, when we look at, at uh, bipolar disorder, the B, BD stands for bipolar disorder. When we look at bipolar disorder, um, and DMDD, uh, you, you look at the prefrontal cortex. I don't have a, a cursor. You can see those tracks. Those are white matter tracks. White matter uh, are the axons of, uh, that, that are connected to dendrites that connect uh, every brain cell to up to 50,000 other brain cells. Uh, so it's a complicated system of over 100 billion brain cells and an infinite number of connections. And at any given time, uh, any one cell can be con communicating within the synapses to thousands and thousands of other cells with both affirmative turn on messages and um, uh, disaffirmative turn off uh, messages. Uh, no clear studies on white matter microstructure in DMDD, uh, but if you look at uh, what's called uh, anastrophe, which is fiber density, axonal diameter, you, you look at this kind of stuff with uh, with a form of MRI called diffusion tensor imaging. 
uh, diffusion tensor imaging. If you don't know about it, it's worth reading. It's interesting. Um, and in particular, looking at the corpus callosum and its connection uh, to the prefrontal uh, cortex, particularly the orbital free pr frontal, the ventral prefrontal through the amygdala, which regulates emotion. And the theory is that there's something about that system that perhaps make uh, people vulnerable for this pattern of extreme emotional outbursts, inconsolable patterns of behavior, uh, and the related patterns of irritability. So we're just beginning to look at this kind of data uh, in terms of, of, of what the, the brain functioning is. Uh, I'm not a biological determinist. Uh, I'm not going to say that these conditions are purely biological. Even conditions like autism, if you look at some of uh, studies done at the Mind Institute, the risk of receiving a diagnosis of autism is equally predicted by your environment, meaning who you're, you live with, who you're in school with, uh, what they know, and do they refer you or take you somewhere, as it's contributed to by physiological uh, functioning. So we've covered sort of the, the, the emergence of a DMD, a little bit about history and SMD, some resources there. We've talked a little bit about differences, the liabilities of the DMDD diagnosis, uh, the fact that I think it's a very good start in our efforts to try and understand this problem of uh, mood dysregulation and irritability in children, uh, and the fact that it's not bipolar disorder. It clearly is different uh, from bipolar disorder. Uh, and so we're making progress there. Uh, and we talked a little bit about the, uh, the diagnostic symptoms, the criteria. Again, in psychiatry, uh, the diagnosis is made by history. Uh, and so you got to use the symptom count. We'll talk about schools here in a minute. But if you're making diagnoses, you got to use the symptoms. And the only way to do that is to take a history and take your time with a history. Because one parent's definition of irritability may be another parent's uh, description of, of a child's normal behavior. So you have to understand where a parent is coming from. You have to take a history and, and questionnaires. Everything else we do doesn't substitute for that. Uh, part of the reason we as school psychologists do a functional observation, go in a classroom to look at kids is because real life behavior always trumps any other kind of data that we can collect. So there's no well validated scales for DMDD. If you're, if you're working with kids with DMDD and you're interested, uh, I'm starting uh, a, a development of an assessment tool, and we will be looking for validity uh, subjects. And if you're interested in collecting data, I'm always looking for that. So there's no gold standard behavioral measure. Uh, I think there are a lot of good uh, broad spectrum measures, the Connors, the Basque, uh, even the Achenbach, uh, and you can bootstrap some of those scales, but there are no specific DMDD scales uh, at this point. Uh, and many of these scales focus on frequency uh, at the expense perhaps of duration or severity. And I think with a condition like DMDD, to truly understand the symptom presentation requires not just an appreciation of frequency, but duration and severity. So if it occurs once a year and it's very severe, uh, that's very different than something that occurs twice a day and is fairly mild and of short duration. Uh, I think few measures that we have available really capture uh, how these children present. Um, and so uh, for the moment, we're left to use the psychiatric description. Uh, there are good measures for assessing aggressive behavior. I'm not gonna favor one measure over another. Um, I, I think you wanna know the measures you use. You wanna understand uh, their reliability and their validity. You want to understand their positive and negative predictive power. Some instruments uh, uh, sacrifice specificity for sensitivity. They want to find everyone with the condition, even at the expense of false positives. Other instru instruments uh, sacrifice uh, sensitivity for specificity. They want to make sure everyone identified has the problem, even if there are some uh, negatives of people who have the problem uh, to a milder degree. Um, and there are good measures for picking up whether kids um, demonstrate this kind of uh, emotional outbursts. Um, scales for measuring aggression may not be the best tools. Um, and a sizable of kids, percentage of kids with temper outbursts um, 
you know, don't meet criteria for DMDD. And as I pointed out, when we looked at a little bit of that epidemiologic data, uh, it's amazing the percentage of parents that will describe irritability or mood outbursts in their children, uh, but again, not to the extent of what the DMDD uh, requires. Uh, so I think you've got to look at all of the inclusion and exclusion criteria as you try and do this. Uh, and irritability, again, is associated with a wide uh, range of conditions. Um, you probably shouldn't start by assuming the problem is DMDD. You probably should start by, as we do in neuropsychology, trying to understand the ongoing uh, process of what's taking place and possibly the underlying uh, contributing uh, factors. Um, I think you got to look at how the family functions. Uh, I don't see how you can do a community-based observation without data from the school. I think you have to ask about uh, past trauma and, and psychiatric disorders. Um, and I don't think you stop with the diagnosis. Um, you know, I think you keep looking for triggers. Again, DMDD as a diagnosis is similar to other DSM conditions that are generally etiology independent, not PTSD, where you have to identify a stressor. But other diagnoses are etiology uh, independent. Uh, and I think uh, uh, as we talk about intervention, um, you're going to have to understand factors in the environment, but either insulate uh, or perhaps protect. Um, uh, and I think treatment planning uh, is a combination. I, I do think a medicine, probably a combination of medicine, is going to be the rule rather than the exception for kids with uh, DMDD. Uh, and to the extent that they will require school intervention, I'm going to show you a uh, someone's doctoral dissertation that actually is a pretty good overview of how to approach uh, treatment. I think you start with a broad spectrum questionnaire. Uh, I think you give narrow spectrum instruments. Uh, many of you use uh, the ASRS that Jack Naglieri and I developed uh, or our CEFI. Um, I think you use narrow band instruments when they're called for to look at conditions like anxiety and depression. Um, I have an instrument that I developed uh, with a WPS. Uh, it's the only tool that combines uh, resiliency factors with risk factors uh, for latency age and teenage and young adults. If you don't know the tool, you can take a look at it. Uh, but it, it's the only one that, that tries to look at risk within the contents or within the construct of what assets do you have. Um, does every child being assessed for DMDD require a full neuropsychological evaluation? Well, that's what I do. So yes, uh, every kid I see uh, has a full evaluation or we bootstrap some data from other sources and try and complete an evaluation. Uh, but I think it's more likely that you'll wanna know the child's level of language and intellect and neuropsychological and executive functioning. I think all that data is important, especially since DMDD is turning out to be a very chronic, severe condition that very clearly will adversely affect children uh, well into their adult years. Um, I think clinical comorbidity is the rule uh, rather than the exception for DMDD. Uh, my feeling is at some point we will uh, 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 accept that you can have a diagnosis of ODD, that you perhaps could have a diagnosis of intermittent explosive disorder. Uh, we'll see how things change as more data is generated. And I think IDEIA eligibility uh, or ADA 504, remember um, those of you in the schools understand that 504 as a part of the Americans with Disabilities Act is an equal access law. It guarantees you access uh, to appropriate services uh, so you're not discriminated against based upon your uh, handicap or liabilities. IDEIA, the Improvement Act, um, it guarantees success. It, it mandates that if what we're doing is in helping, uh, we have to do more. So in fact, we do both for children at school. It, it is a much greater probability than not that kids with a DMDD will meet uh, uh, a need for special services at school. So what about IDEIA? And I have IDEA there to go back to the original category. Uh, again, it was a legislated mandate uh, that was then revised 
it's it's not an exhaustive list of every disability and and so what do we do you know in 1992 uh, ADHD or ADD was not in the special ed law and there were hundreds of lawsuits against school districts for not uh, serving kids with ADD that was considered under ADA a disability which is when 504 was introduced to the schools if a child doesn't meet criteria for uh, IDEA they can be served under ADA again I think they're different laws one equal access one equal success but there was an effort to recognize that IDEA did not include every adversity so one option is other health impairment of which ADHD falls in that category if ADHD can be served there um, in some states <coughs> why not DMDD <coughs> emotional disturbance well, um, you know, that includes, the law reads, it includes schizophrenia, bipolar, OCD. In some states, it's called behavioral disturbance. Uh, every state has interpreted the federal guidelines a little differently. Maybe DMDD might best fall there. <clears throat> and maybe under multiple disability, there's a link there to an interesting uh, review article about multiple disability. And in different states, there are different criteria to be identified with multiple disability. Uh, and most uh, state education offices in taking a survey <clears throat> of students in their districts that are being served under special ed only take into account the primary condition. So you can say the child has multiple disabilities and in many states, they still wanna know what the primary eligibility determination is. Um, the time will tell. For the moment, there's no right or wrong. I think the issue is, to identify what kinds of behaviors lead to what types of impairments in what settings and what kinds of interventions, whether it's antecedent, doing things to prevent a problem, <clears throat> whether it's managing uh, the environment, creating a prosthetic environment to minimize problems, uh, whether it's an after the fact behavior management program, uh, whether it's a supportive counseling, uh, or SEL training or skill building. I think we start with what's the need of the child. And for the moment, uh, I don't know if you need a DMD diagnosis uh, to be classified as having emotional disturbance, uh, if in fact uh, it's been demonstrated that that disturbance in the school causes you challenges and impairment and interferes with your education. Here are um, some references. The bottom two are books. Uh, the bottom one is a book that in its third edition uh, that I uh, had the great pleasure of writing with Nancy Mather, who's the godmother of the Woodcock Johnson and Katie Eklund. Um, and we've got strategies in there, but even that book doesn't talk about DMDD. The first three you'll see are school interventions for disruptive behavior. And I think we go back to the category rather than say DMDD or conduct disorder or ODD but to define it as disruptive behavior. Uh, the top one is a good meta-analysis <clears throat> from 2007 that looks at different kinds of strategies. And then psychiatric treatment. Um, again, very limited studies, um, an expanding database for SMD, um, but it's not SMD. I, can, I don't know that we can use uh, medicines that treated SMD and say they're gonna treat DMDD well. Um, you can see the bottom in the multimodal treatment study, that's that multi-site study that took place in the 90s for ADHD. Um, you know, medicines that are targeted at ADHD symptoms, typically a stimulants um, uh, or other related uh, um, uh, reuptake blockers lead to reduced irritability in kids with ADHD. Uh, might they do that in kids with DMDD or might they exacerbate their mood outbursts is clearly uh, not well known. There's one randomized control trial with lithium, which is used to treat bipolar disorder. It didn't help kids with SMD. <coughs> There's one uh, control study of kids with ADHD and an aggressive behavior taking the anticonvulsant uh, Depakote. Um, uh, they all had psychosocial treatment um, and they all benefited some from medication. 
And then this is fairly new. Uh, <coughs> this anticonvulsant, which is uh, uh, marketed as uh, trileptal, uh, oxcarbazepine, uh, and amantadine. Amantadine is an antidiskinetic. It's used for Parkinson's. But what's so interesting about this is that uh, one is considered uh, to impact the frontal lobes and the other to stabilize that temporal uh, limbic system we looked at a few minutes ago. Uh, and so maybe the combination of those two. Uh, I do not know of any child in our clinic who's receiving those two at the moment, but I do think we're gonna see that um, as psychiatrists are educated about this, um, I think we're gonna see that combination how well it helps DMDD remains to be seen. And then there's a link there for oxytocin. Oxytocin is the chemical that released, is released when mothers uh, give birth. Uh, it's why the mother zebra stands in front of her baby to, in front of the lions. Uh, oxytocin is released. Um, again, it creates this connection between birth mother and child. Uh, oxytocin has been used in a number of studies with kids with autism, demonstrating some improved uh, social behavior. Uh, some call it the love drug that supposedly increases your love connection. Uh, there's more fable than fact about oxytocin, uh, but you can read that link about DMDD and oxytocin. Uh, I have about seven minutes left here. Take a look at, at uh, these studies. There are the links uh, to take a look at them. Um, and, uh, so, and, and, and psychiatric uh, treatment. Uh, and there's a few more. Um, again, all of this has been driven by this concern for this pattern of chronic irritability in childhood and these disruptive outbursts that just go on and on. The child's inconsolable. Uh, I do not know Tom Smith. There is a link there to his doctoral dissertation, uh, which he did in 2018. And Tom, if you're on this call, I would love to talk to you. Um, but this was his dissertation uh, developing, he did, I don't believe he tested it, but developing an eight session program um, for children with DMDD. And you can see the description of the program and you can read his doctoral dissertation. I think, you know, as school psychologists, we bootstrap a lot of information from a lot of other sources and, and uh, uh, some of us better than others uh, skillfully weave that information into what we do. Um, I really like this guy's manual. I would hope someday uh, he puts it into a published uh, book. It's the only treatment manual I can find. And again, it's, a, it's someone's dissertation. Um, psychosocial treatments for DMDD. Uh, there's a couple of studies that you can read uh, on you know, how much were they effective. Uh, and then there's something called exposure-based cognitive behavioral therapy. That probably requires an hour to talk about. Read the link. Uh, the question is, can you stress inoculate someone by slowly desensitizing them to stressful experiences with the hope that uh, they gain better control over their nervous system? And there's one study looking at dialectical behavior therapy uh, in, a, in an adolescent letter, Brown University letter, that says maybe it could be helpful um, there's the DOI for that. You can look at that as well. Um, a few more references. Uh, again, looking at psychosocial um, interventions. I mean, we're just at the beginning of trying to examine what works uh, and what uh, probably doesn't work beyond uh, placebo. That case study, that second one there, that's really interesting. Uh, if you don't read a whole lot, read that case study. That's the exposure-based therapy. Uh, it's pretty interesting. It's just a single case. Should we consider CAM treatments? There's something called the Marshall Protocol. Dr. Marshall is an engineer and not uh, a mental health professional. Um, and his theory is that there's some immunologic problem that leads to the proliferation of certain kinds of bacteria. And he has a protocol of uh, what you should eat and not eat, what kinds of lights you should expose yourself to or not. Um, uh, you know, I don't know whether that works or not. There's a link for brain training, uh, chiropractic manipulation, various homeopathy, uh, acupuncture, uh, or cranial sacral therapy, 
aromatherapy. There's a good literature review. Uh, you can take a look at it. CAM treatments, complementary alternative uh, medicine. So here are the conclusions. And I may go over a minute or two because I think we should go through this. There's a group of kids somewhere between uh, a quarter of a percent and 3% who have severe mood dysregulation and intermittent irritability. We once said they had severe ADHD. Now we don't say that. The DSM-5 gives us a framework. Large scale population studies have not been done looking at this framework. Uh, a large group of kids referred for other problems demonstrate symptoms of DMDD, but not the full disorder. Children with DMDD have a high rate of comorbidity, of co-occurring other problems, but it seems to be a distinct condition with chronic non-episodic irritability that does not evolve into bipolar disorder for most of these children. There's no well-established treatment strategies at this point. There's no norm reference behavioral tool. Kids with this diagnosis end up on a combination of psychiatric medications with a less than optimal response. It's my theory that that's because uh, the medicines help the biochemistry, but don't change the physical structure of the brain. Again, relatively common, maybe 3% versus 1% for bipolar disorder. Uh, uh, no established treatment, as I mentioned a minute ago. It's not an IDEIA. When IDEIA is improved a second time, so it'll be the Individuals with Disabilities Improvement Improvement Act, um, I suspect DMDD will be in there. Uh, the best approach, I think, what we're trying to do at our center uh, is carefully evaluate uh, medicines, sometimes go back to no medicine and start over again so we understand the benefits and the side effects of what medicine does, have very clear target behaviors for the medicine so we don't end up treating one side effect, the, the side effects of one medicine with another medicine. I think parent training, there's a link there um, to Ross Green's uh, uh, program. If you're familiar with his Lives in the Balance, Ross Green's uh, 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 idea of the explosive child, I think there's a, a a lot of similarity in what Ross writes about. He has a wonderful website. Parents can watch um, uh, his videos for free. Um, I think some kind of parent training is needed. Um, uh, training that teaches parents to manage crises without getting out of control, that teaches parents to manage violent and aggressive behavior. Um, I think cognitive behavioral therapy for support would be beneficial. I think parents and teachers, uh, as we teach teachers to manage uh, emotional and behavioral crises in outbursts of children at school uh, will be needed. I think most likely it's ED eligibility. And I think we reasonably consider CAM treatments. I'm not recommending uh, uh, an exorcism, uh, but I might uh, recommend um, uh, relaxation training. I think I did it. Um, there's my uh, website. I did a TED talk a while ago. There's my website. There's all kinds of articles, uh, other webinars or links to webinars are posted there. Uh, there's my email. I answer all my email. Uh, there's my Twitter and Facebook. If you're working with kids with DMDD and you have cases you'd like to share, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, I'm editing a textbook for Springer on DMDD. Uh, and uh, if you have a particular interest and want to write, uh, not unexpectedly, it's hard to find contributors for these chapters uh, because most people don't know a lot about it and there isn't a lot of research. So uh, I want to thank WPS for asking me to do this. And when I suggested DMDD as a topic uh, for being responsive uh, to this particular topic, because I think it's something that uh, we all need to learn more about and will learn more about over the coming years. So thanks very much. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Goldstein. And I just want, before everybody starts jumping off, because people are saying thank you, and I'm, I'm worried that they might jump off, but we're about to do a question and answer session with Dr. Goldstein with some of the questions that you have submitted ahead of time and also some that you've put in the Q&A. So please don't go anywhere. I know that people have dropped off because they saw the thank you. So I just want them to hang around. 
I also want to let you know that some of the tools Dr. Goldstein referenced are on this page. You can get a 10% off uh, discount on WPS products with the code that's listed there on the PowerPoint, WPS22SGW at checkout. And that offer expires February 28th. Next slide. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I am Stephanie Roberts and I am a business development manager. I was so excited about introducing Dr. Goldstein. I forgot about myself and that happens all the time. But uh, we also have these wonderful WPS assessment consultants that can help answer any of your assessment questions. Please just uh, re reach out to them at consult at wpspublish.com. Next slide. Did it come up? Did the slide right. come up? Yep, it's okay. up, it's up. Okay, so also if you want to um, get more information about a variety of other topics, uh, you can also do this, uh, fill out this contact us page and we will get back to you if you have uh, additional requests. And if you are interested in data collection, things like that. Uh, we also want to invite you to our upcoming, I know we had some OTs that were on the call, our upcoming webinar, Assessing Sensory Integration and Processing in Individuals with Developmental Disabilities with Dr. Douglene Jackson. She'll be presenting that. That's on March 2nd from 9 to 10 Pacific time AM. If you haven't seen all of these resources, these are very important resources, our YouTube channel, our uh, uh, video resources, our content hub, all of these, you are going to find a lot of information, including a lot of wonderful uh, webinar presentations from various authors on a variety of topics, including dyslexia, autism, et cetera. Including okay. some of my earlier ones that I did for you. Yes, and on, he did some uh, talks on resilience as well. So that's great. And uh, some information about uh, the assessment you mentioned earlier, RISE. You can go to the next slide. All right, here we go. So are you ready for, let's see, 11 minutes, 15 minutes of fast speed question and answer, Dr. Goldstein? Okay, let's do it. All right, so question number one. Administrators are hesitant to discipline students with EBD or autism disabilities, even when their behavior warrants consequences. What are your thoughts on this hesitancy? Okay, so let's make a distinction in trying to understand the value of punishment. So punishment is an aversive consequence that's provided in, in an effort to uh, have the child cease a particular behavior, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if I punish you because you had a seizure, the, the experience of that punishment in no way um, enables you uh, to be any more competent in controlling your electrical activity in your brain. Now, let's shift gears. Uh, punishment can have another role. Punishment can help a child understand the limits of acceptable behavior. Uh, if a child has ADHD uh, and now they're driving and a police officer stops them, I don't want them to say, oh, please excuse me, I have ADHD. It doesn't excuse you from following the rules of our society. So what I advocate for is for you to make a distinction. If you believe the child has the capacity to benefit from the experience of punishment and to use that experience to guide their behavior the next time, then yes, punishment is an effective intervention. If it's your belief that the child can experience the punishment and understand it, but possesses limited capacity, whether it's because they have poor impulse control, or poor insight as in autism, they have limited capacity to do what they know. They've learned it, but can't implement it. Punishment is only half of what you need to do. You provide punishment to those children to help them appreciate there are limits to your behavior in an organized society. But you don't expect that the punishment alone is sufficient for that child to utilize that experience to shift their behavior the next time. You have to provide some training, whether it's in vivo, in the real world, or some other kind of uh, you know, instruction, whatever the case may be, punishment for those kids helps them appreciate limits, but some skill building will then put them in a better position to act within those limits. It's a good question. Yeah, I love that distinction that you made. It's very important. I know that uh, when I was working as a school psychologist, that, that came up a lot. 
especially when um, autos, uh, office referrals were high and people wanted to keep those down, et cetera. Let's look at a different, a slightly different topic here. How is uh, DMDD affecting um, bilingual Spanish speakers? Is it, are they affected any different? Um, they're not referring to newcomers or recent immigrants, but kids dealing with learning two languages or having language barriers. You know that TV show where you can win a million dollars and you have a choice. You can say, <laughs> I'll take the money I earned and I'm leaving. I'll take the money I earned and I'm leaving. Uh, I can't don't say phone a, don't say phone a friend. Phone a friend, have right? An <laughs> right. We don't know. But let's think in a broader way. What kinds of developmental or experiential variables reduce a child's capacity to cope with stress and adversity? Because as I mentioned in this presentation, I expect we're gonna discover that conditions like DMDD are similar to autism or other conditions in which, yes, your biological vulnerability is a significant contributor, but equally contributing is your experience in life, right? So a, a child prone to worry in a home with a very worried mother will manifest quite a bit more worrisome behavior than with a parent who understands how to help the child learn to manage that. So bilingualism is an adversity. I think for some it's an advantage. Clearly learning uh, at an early age two languages is clearly puts them in an advantage uh, and maybe even puts them in an advantage in terms of critical thinking or other areas of development. This research has been done and it, it, you, know, you almost feel like every child should learn two languages right out of the gate. But if you're struggling more so in one language than another, and you're in an environment where competency in the language in which you struggle is, is a, a high priority, then if you're prone to be irritable, if you're prone to have outbursts and you don't communicate effectively, language is the window into the mind, then I would expect that if you're at risk for DMDD and you struggle as an English as a second language learner, uh, it's more likely you'll manifest more severe symptoms of DMDD, but nobody knows that yet. Okay, is there a rise in symptoms post-pandemic in lower socioeconomic individuals? Ooh, that's a really good question. So let me answer it in generally. So lower SES tends to contribute to higher risk for all kinds of problems. Now that is not any kind of a criticism of those families or those parents. It's an observation of, of a parent's access to services, of a parent's particular experiences. If you know the ACEs study, the, the 10 trauma variables that children are exposed to, as socioeconomic status goes down, the number of adversities a child may experience within a family goes up. It's just the unfortunate consequence that, that Poverty uh, in and of itself may not cause problems, but the, the difficulties that are associated with poverty in and of themselves cause difficulty. So we know that. So I would suspect we may find that DMDD is, is similar. How similar is unclear. We could ask the question, is epilepsy more common in children in lower socioeconomic status? And I don't think that's the case. Right, because it's purely a, a neurological condition. Maybe obesity is higher. Maybe diabetes might be higher because of children's diet. And maybe DMDD is slightly higher, but not as high to the extent as say depression or anxiety might be. It's uh, still unknown. It, it, I'm in a very good position here because it's unknown. And so I don't have to say, I don't know, let me go look. I can say, as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been studied yet. Gotcha. Well, are there any uh, effective antecedent interventions for DMDD? Oh, sure. So everybody understands antecedent, right? Doing before. So <clears throat> most of what we do with kids, especially with DMDD, is tertiary care. We wait until they're drowning. And then we say, oh, let's see if we need help. So what's primary care? That would be antecedent educating everyone about irritability and mood outbursts such that when a child begins exhibiting that, the parent immediately knows where to go for a resource, recognizes what the source of the behavior is, doesn't go down a punitive 
uh, a parent, parental role in an effort to stem the behavior. That would be primary. Secondary would be identifying children at risk, right? So if the diagnosis of DMDD can't be made till after six, but the early precursors are there, very clearly they're there, maybe we, we create uh, like we do with autism, where the pediatrician now, you know, all pediatricians now, uh, based on the American Academy of Pediatrics mandate, screen children at two and two and a half and three, asking parents simple questions about autism. It doesn't mean if a parent says, yes, the child has autism, but the pediatrician uses it as a basis for referring the child on for further assessment. Ideally, what I'd like to see. Uh, is a similar kind of screener created by the American Academy of Pediatricians or Family Medicine in which at three and four, the same series of questions would be asked about mood dysregulation and inconsolable behavior and irritability. And those children at risk in a secondary antecedent way would then be referred on, not to pathologize or demonize them, but to begin to set in place uh, interventions uh, given their risk, right? Often by the time we start working with kids, the, the, their problems are so uh, uh, ingrained or intense that we're almost too late to the table, right? Um, so antecedent would be great. All right, well, I have a, a question and then I'm gonna add a little bit onto it because I have multiple people asking this question. So it's a two-parter here. What is the relationship between DMDD and pathological demand avoidance? And can you also differentiate DMDD from intermittent explosive disorder? The second one is easier because I did that in the presentation in which I, I, I said that you could easily argue that kids with DMDD exhibit intermittent explosive disorder, but not all kids with intermittent explosive disorder demonstrate the irritability the patterns of irritability characteristic of DMDD, right? And if you go look at the two diagnostic criteria, you'll see that. I argued the same thing for autism and ADHD, that nearly two thirds of kids with ADHD demonstrate symptom criteria, uh, uh, excuse me, two thirds of kids with autism demonstrate symptom criteria for ADHD, but most kids with ADHD don't have autism, right? So there's an overlap more in one direction than in another. I don't know, what that term is that you just uh, utilized. I don't know what a demand disorder is. When we get off, I'll certainly go look, um, but I, I, I know it's not a diagnostic term. So uh, someone yeah. knows more about it than me. Yeah, these, um, these were the questions that uh, were submitted ahead of time that we had on the list, uh, the relationship between DMDD and pathological demand avoidance. So we can skip through that one and add it to the list later. Sure. Uh, let's go to the next one. I see some kids who present with nearly all the symptoms, but I rarely find one who meets the criteria of persistently irritable or angry most of the day between outbursts. Parents report they can be quite pleasant, so I tend to move away from DMDD and consider IED, but that feels more aggressive behavioral than mood related and doesn't feel like a great fit either. Can you comment on the chronic irritability criteria is it possible parents are not great reporters of this and maybe their perceptions are skewed by more severe outbursts they than they witness? So part of the reason we created census matched, statistically derived, meaning using uh, exploratory factor analysis uh, tools is because based on our experiences, we all have our anchor points. You know, what is severe? What is moderate? What is mild? And, and the effort to try and quantify this is challenging. Uh, again, as this uh, uh, participant pointed out, um, in my experience, I think that criteria may be a little too narrow. I also am seeing kids coming in with a DMDD diagnosis who don't meet that criteria. So again, the risk of false positive outweighs the risk of false negative. And I think the reason that criteria is so specific is that, that the research team that created it was worried about overdiagnosis. Um, I can't tell you how to apply it because uh, 
you're going to have to decide that on your own how to best apply it. I agree, it's not intermittent explosive disorder. Um, I can mention a child I saw, I see some of these kids in counseling, and I can mention a little girl that, that I clear, clearly struggles with this. It was a, I think it was the first or the second case study today. Um, and she does have periods where she's particularly uh, pleasant. Um, uh, typically, she has some outbursts during the course of the day. Uh, and, and her style, what we're not looking at is personality style. She's particularly ingratiating. She, she's just so syrupy that you wonder if like, does she really mean what she's saying? And what is she? So when she's not irritable and upset, she's this syrupy, very nice. Did I hurt your feelings, Dr. Sam? I hope you're not upset about that. And then when I ask her about, you know, what do you think and why are you doing that? She says, well, I don't care what anybody thinks. So there's this, you know, again, there's this kind of dichotomy or this conflict in what she says versus how she behaves. Um, I think that criteria may modify at some point, but I agree every clinician has to decide how to apply these criteria. So it's interesting because uh, a lot of people asked about, uh, and I know you talked a little bit about this, but I just wanna revisit it because there were still questions in the Q and A. Um, are you, uh, what if you are suspecting autism? Are you allowed to di diagnose DMDD with autism? H how, how do you go about that clinical picture? Do you remember what the criteria said? The criteria said a rule out. If you diagnose autism, you don't diagnose DMDD. And what I said was, as far as I can see, there's no, again, there, there are not a lot of studies. There's no a census match for sure, but no population, even small population-based study that allows you to look at the overlap between autism and DMDD. Uh, time will tell. Part of what I'm gonna do when we look at these behaviors in the general population, which also hasn't been done, uh, is then to look at validity samples and see what the incidence of this condition is. If we find the incidence of meeting this condition in kids with autism is you know, 25% or 20%, then you make both diagnoses. If it's 70%, then you don't. I mean, if the overlap is so much, then making a second diagnosis is redundant. But if the overlap is, is not as much, then yeah, they, the, the majority of kids with, with DMDD don't have autism. And the majority of kids with autism don't have DMDD. But then there's gonna be some kids in the middle who have both. Look, this has been an ongoing debate. For example, with ADHD, when the DSM was revised, there was a, an argument made that ADHD with oppositional behavior should be a separate diagnosis. That those kids present differently, have a different course over time than kids with ODD or kids with ADHD alone. And the argument was made that that by making both diagnoses, you, you have two separate entities, but by saying, no, this is a condition. And when you have this, these two sets of symptoms, you really have a different course over time, different risk factors, different kind of impairment. Obviously that didn't make it into the DSM. And the question is how far do you take it? ADHD with anxiety, should that be a singular diagnosis? Um, uh, the only thing I'll add is that our efforts to use spectrum as a describer may help with this. So people ask, you know, what is a spectrum? And often the response that comes back is like in, in, in autism, it's a mild to severe, right? But that's a continuum. A spectrum is like the rays of a sun, the rays going out. And the further those rays go, the further apart they get. And in autism, the term spectrum, it, it's like light passing through a prism. And that's how Lorna Wing referred to the outcome of kids with autism. So you start with a basic core condition that everyone has, but outcome over time is influenced by other genetics, family experience, uh, life experience, schooling, uh, et cetera. We use the term spectrum with schizophrenia now as well. Um, the term spectrum you saw comes up in another condition as well. And I think eventually we will move to spectrum, not a continuum not mild to moderate to severe, but, but uh, the understanding that a core set of problems starts with every child and then life experience and genetics then influences 
where those kids go. And the longer they progress through life, uh, the more diverse their outcome is over time. Well, okay. Well, I do have another question that you may or may not have answers to because of the, the very short-term nature of, of the existence of this disorder, right? So uh, some people have asked about the, the correlation or relationship between DMDD and self-harm, suicide, suicide risk, et cetera, and also substance abuse. Yeah, very good. So let's do the second one first. Um, uh, I don't know of any studies specifically looking at DMDD and substance abuse. So why do people abuse substances? Either they're lubricating their unhappiness, uh, they impulsively can't control themselves, or they just like it, right? So of those three, people with DMDD might be more prone to, to use substances to lubricate their unhappiness, whereas kids with ADHD are more prone to use substances because they're impulsive and, and they can't regulate themselves. I think we're gonna find that among teenagers, the incidence of, of various kinds of substance abuse are uh, much higher uh, in kids with uh, DMDD. We'll see. Now, what was this, the first part of the question? <laughs> oh, uh, suicide risk, self-harm. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and there too, um, you notice the criteria of MDD doesn't include suicidal thinking or suicidal thought or action. Um, so uh, uh, that too is unclear. Uh, you're well aware, Stephanie, from our work together with the RISE, when we looked at kids who were in institutional settings for risky behavior like self-harm and suicide, they tended to have uh, lower emotional balance, lower feelings of connection to people, uh, lower uh, self-esteem, feelings about themselves. All three of those would be a logical consequence if your days were filled with irritability and emotional outbursts, and eventually people just didn't want to be around you anymore, right? So there may well be an increased risk. And I'm going to throw you one last question, and then we're going to wrap it up. And don't worry, for those of you who did not get your questions answered, we are going to submit all the questions to Dr. Goldstein. He's going to then uh, give us some responses to those, and we're going to post them in the same place we're posting uh, the webinar. But for the final question, if DMDD does not evolve, evolve into bipolar disorder, is there another disorder that tends to evolve to and evolve, evolve into in adulthood? Or is it too uh, that's soon the, to tell? That, that's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm, not a, and I'm not a slumdog millionaire, but I'll answer the question. We don't know. Keep in mind, if you ask me about First, every time the DSM changes, diagnostic criteria change slightly, right? So you have that to deal with over time longitudinally. But if you ask me, tell me about children in their 40s who during their teenage years had ADHD. There's a lot of very good studies. That's true okay. for other conditions as well. Since DMDD was first diagnosed in 2013, there's nothing. Even if you were diagnosed yeah. with it as, an, as a 17 year old in 2013. So today right. you're 26. Right. Now kids with so severe, why, why do you, oh, well, let ahead. me just finish. So kids with severe mm -hmm. mood disorders, they have been followed, but we've, I've already pointed out that SMD is not the equivalent of DMDD in how the diagnosis has been created. So we really don't know, but I'll tell you, I worry the most about children's mindsets how they feel about themselves, what they learn about themselves, what they think about their place in the world, what they think about the world. And, and I can't help but think that if every day of your life is this chaotic up and down and emotional dysregulation and, and disruption with peers and family and school, um, I would think over time, the onset of a major depression or the cycling in and out of major depressive episodes and irritable outbursts may be the destiny for many of these kids, but I don't think anybody knows. All right, well, and then I'm just gonna follow that up with, this is probably not a quick question, but I'm going to anyway. Why is it that they don't respond very well to meds? Okay, and, and you know, in my New York style, I speak very quickly. 
Go. Nobody knows. <laughs> but my thought is conditions that respond to medicines like depression and anxiety and ADHD and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have more to do with the biochemistry of your brain than the structure of your brain. And conditions that don't respond as well to meds like personality disorder or autism or learning disability have more to do with the structure and changing the biochemistry doesn't really change your problem. What I've argued is that DMDD, and I don't have any way of proving it at this point, is, is a condition that represents disruption of physiology. And physiology is the interaction of your structural brain and your biochemistry. And for that reason, the psychiatric medicines help some, but not enough that one medicine, like with a stimulant for ADHD or an antidepressant for depression or anxiety, that you say, wow, this, this significant improvement, okay, let's move on. Because the biochemistry is altered somewhat and that may contribute to the condition, but perhaps uh, an equally contributing factor are those white matter tracks that go from the corpus callosum up through the amygdala down to the prefrontal cortex and how that system operates structurally may be equally, if not more responsible for why children end up behaving this way. You know, Dr. Goldstein, I love that you're not afraid to put your opinion out there based on obviously your years and years of experience and uh, and you're in your thinking about, you know, what's going to happen with this research and we'll have to see. And I love that you're willing to do that. I, I want to thank you from WPS for your presentation at the webinar and uh, hopefully we'll be working together soon. And uh, for the audience, if you have any additional questions, please email consult at wpspublish.com. We have assessment consult consultants that have experience in a variety of fields such as occupational therapy, speech language pathology, school psychology, neuropsychology, et cetera. If you have questions or thoughts or any, you wanna give us feedback about anything, webinars or assessments, please feel free to email us at consult at wpspublish.com. Thank you, everyone.